Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. It is so good to have the Gaithersburg Book Festival back. My name is Kate Stewart, and I'm the mayor in the city of Tacoma Park, and we're glad to have you here today. Um, I'll quickly go through a couple of logistics before introducing Jamie. Uh, we are so glad to have the opportunity to be back in person and to share the love of books here in Gaithersburg and around Montgomery County. And as a fellow mayor, I just want to do a huge shout out to uh, the mayor of Gaithersburg, who, you know, this is really his baby. He has, you know, put this together, his thinking, and we are so grateful to him. And I know what it's like to be a, a fellow mayor, especially over the last couple of years, and to keep a vision like this alive and put it together. Just congratulations, Judd, on all your work. Woo! logistics um, please silence all your devices for the latest updates make sure you're following the Gaithersburg book festival on Facebook and Twitter if you post about the festival please use the hashtag GBF your feedback is valuable surveys are available on the website which you can access at the Gaithersburg book or using the QR code you see on the signs around the festival by submitting the survey, you will be entered into a drawing for a $100 Visa gift card. Congressman Raskin will be signing books immediately after the presentation, and copies of his book are on sale in the Politics and Prose store in the Activity Center. A quick plug for buying books. This is a free event, but it does help our festival if you buy lots of books. The more books that are sold at the event, the more publishers who will want to send their authors here to speak. Purchasing books from our partner, Politics and Prose, helps support one of the world's largest independent bookstores. It benefits our local economy and supports local jobs. And as mayors, we love them. Um, and by the way, they make great gifts. So enjoy the program, and we're going to get ready. All right, those are logistics. Now I get to introduce Congressman Raskin, or Jamie. Many of us know Jamie as our beloved congressman, neighbor, friend, and I get to call him one of my constituents, <laughs> which isn't always easy. Um, he has given us so much and so much to this country. And we are fortunate that during all of what has been going on these last few years, this tumultuous time in our country, he also took time to memorialize these events in a book. And I'm going to admit something to you all in a moment, but first, I'm going to say, read the book keep the book, pass the book down to your children and grandchildren. So no matter what happens in the next couple of weeks or months or years, they have a record of this time. They will know a piece of the story of what's happening in our country right now and the role that one man and one family had in fighting for justice and the rule of law in our country. Maya Angelou said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Bearing witness is not easy, but it is necessary. The word witness is rooted in to bear in mind, to remember, to be careful. A witness is someone who has knowledge of something by recollection, expertise, and who can tell it accurately. We are fortunate to have Jamie Raskin as our witness, willing to bear his and our country's story. Right now, bearing witness to what is happening in our country is an imperative. We must bear witness to ensure that future generations know the sacrifice and struggles of those who stood up for freedom, justice, and the rule of law. Also, we need to make sure history is not rewritten or that the events of these last few years are minimized in the future. In particular, when we talk about witnessing, witnessing a story is powerful. It allows people to hear of events transcend time. And we've all heard that saying that one is never truly forgotten when one is shared and carried in the hearts of others. And that is true with, with this story. So now to my confession. I haven't read the book. <laughs> I haven't. I have it. I actually got it fine. And one day I will read it. But personally, the events of the last few years 
are too close and too overwhelming for me personally. For the book is not only about the unthinkable acts that occurred on and led up to January 6th. It is also about the unimaginable tragedy and grief of losing a child to depression and suicide. And that's part of the story needs to be told. Not only to acknowledge the profound impact that Tommy Raskin had on his family, friends, and community, but to recognize and give voice to the challenges confront of us confronting mental illness that touch all of us. So for this I say with deep gratitude to Jamie, thank you. Thank you for not only sharing your strength and wisdom, but your pain with us. For bearing witness and naming the unthinkable. You have given us and future generations a gift. Thank you. Thank my mayor, Kate Stewart, who traveled all the way from Tacoma Park to Texas. <laughs> the House Africa Constituent Service. Uh, nobody beats Kate Stewart. So, uh, Kate, thank you for those uh, meaningful words. Um, I want to thank, I'm seeing a bunch of those I read banned books t shirts. And that, those are so awesome. Uh, we had a, a hearing in my subcommittee on civil rights and civil liberties and oversight committee. This week on the banning of books, the banning of ideas, and uh, uh, we're, we're going to turn it around uh, because it's a hallmark of the authoritarian regimes that they attack books and ideas and facts and science, and then they replace it with conspiracy theory, disinformation, and dogma like white replacement theory, which kills. Um, so thank you for that. Thank you for everybody standing up for the right to read. Thank you for everybody reading. Thank, thank you, Gaithersburg, for this magnificent <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if uh, Mayor Judd Ashman is here. Is, is Judd in the house? Uh, no. He'll be here, too. So he'll be, he'll be here. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to also salute him for his vision in creating this and the great people of Gaithersburg. And, uh, you know, I was really, I, I lost in the redistricting all of Frederick County and Carroll County that I had, but I was thinking I'm at least going to get Gaithersburg. Uh, but but um, I don't know if I got Gaithersburg. I, it's, I got a little slice or sliver like the suburbs of Gaithersburg. I don't know. Uh, but, um, but I got, there, there, I must have some 8th District people. Are there Rockville people? Yeah. Yeah. I love the, all the Rockville people. Wheaton and Silver Spring and Bethesda and Deb and John and uh, all of you guys. I love you very much. Thank you for uh, braving these uh, soaring climate change temperatures uh, on May 21. Uh, I'd like to say on Capitol Hill, it's not the heat, it's the stupidity. Uh, and uh, uh, you are uh, counteracting the heat in the tent and you're counteracting the stupidity by reading and buying books yeah. and talking about books. Uh, so I love I love this festival. Um, let me just say a few things, and, I, and then we'll open it up for questions because um, you know I, nobody needs a political filibuster uh, in, in this uh, heat wave we're going through. Um, but um, you know, my family experienced two shocking traumas um, at the end of the year, um, 2020, and the first week of 2021. Uh, on the very last day of the year, we lost our beloved Tommy, uh, who some of you may have had the opportunity to meet. I know Mayor Stewart knew Tommy, and he was just, um, just a dazzling boy and young man. And he was uh, a poet, and he was uh, an essayist, he was a writer, he was a stand-up comedian, he was a blues pianist, he was a second year at Harvard Law School um, when we lost him, he was a teacher, um, and he was really, I, I hope I'm not just overstating this with excessive paternal pride, but I think that uh, he had the qualities of a great moral 
visionary about him, and I write about it in the book. Um, and um, he had much greater hopes for democracy. He didn't want less from democracy. He wanted more from democracy. And he, he dreamed of a day when all of the people of the world would have democracy and human rights. And he hated war. And if he saw what Vladimir Putin was doing to the sovereign democratic people of Ukraine today, it would break his heart. It would crush him, I know. He was uh, a crusader, an advocate for human rights. He loved Amnesty International. He loved Oxfam. Uh, he never had any money because whatever money he made, whatever it was, whether it was working in an ice cream store or a grocery store or tutoring or teaching, he would immediately give it all away. And he would send it to the troops that were fighting for human rights uh, all over the world. And um, Tommy battled uh, depression in those last few years. And those of you who have any family experience with it will understand uh, what a terrible beast and what a terrible burden uh, that is. And so I try to tell the story of it while giving central prominence to Tommy's life, his, the 25 years that, um, that we had with him. And uh, I always feel like he was a messenger from a future time that was beyond war, beyond animal slaughter. He was a passionate vegan. Um, and beyond the cruelties that surround us in the world today. Um, so um, anyway, we lost him on the last day of December 31st, uh, 2020. And um, we were surrounded, well, we were immersed in grief and trauma. Um, and we were surrounded by a lot of love and an outpouring of affection from our family and our friends, our neighbors, my constituents from throughout the 8th District. Um, and we um, we buried Tommy here in Montgomery County um, uh, at the Garden of Remembrance on uh, a cold and gray and rainy, drizzly day on January 5th. And um, that was six days later. And then the next day, was January the 6th. And um, my daughters, Hannah and Tabitha, and nieces and nephews, everybody was telling me, don't go in, don't, you know, you don't need to go back yet. And um, uh, I told them, it's in the Constitution, it's in the 12th Amendment. Uh, it says that the Congress will meet in joint session on the Wednesday of the first week of January following a presidential election. And we had to count the electors. It was constitutional duty for me. And moreover, we were in the midst, as I suppose we still are, of COVID-19, this terrible plague on the land that was so exacerbated by the recklessness and the malice of our political leadership that brought us to the point of almost becoming a failed state, which the political scientists define as a state that cannot deliver the basic goods of existence to its people. But we were in the middle of that, and there were members of Congress dropping like flies, calling in and saying they couldn't come. And our margin in the House was just five votes at that point. So I was afraid of that. Uh, and then Speaker Pelosi had asked me to get up on the floor to answer the anticipated objections to the receipt of Electoral College votes from the swing states, specifically Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Nevada, New Mexico. And so we had been preparing uh, our refutations of the claims being made about these states, which was pretty easy because, as you know, more than 60 federal and state courts had demolished every objection uh, to these uh, results in these states based on uh, debunking all of the claims of electoral, electoral corruption and irregularity. So in any event, I said, I've got to go in. But anybody who wants to come with me can come. And our youngest daughter, Tabitha, decided she wanted to come. And um, Hank, who's married to our oldest daughter, uh, Hannah, decided that he wanted to come. And a uh, brief uh, little footnote here, but they had just gotten married in um, 
an elopement uh, for one of those Elvis Presley weddings in Nevada. You can imagine how popular that was. Uh, in Nevada. Um, but it was COVID-19, so all bets were off, and a lot of young people were doing that. But anyway, Hank decided that he wanted to come. And I remember very clearly to have the same to me um, before leaving, well, it's going to be all right, right? I mean, it's going to be safe because we heard that Donald Trump was trying to get people to come there to protest. And I said, oh, yeah, of course it will be safe, I said all too quickly. Um, and I had a very specific image in my mind, which was from June 2nd of 2021. Now, on June 1st, 2021, you may recall that uh, Donald Trump and Attorney General William Barr had unleashed a paramilitary police riot on Black Lives Matter protesters in Lafayette Square. And I knew about it, I wasn't there, but a lot of my constituents were there, especially a lot of uh, college kids who were back for the summer, a lot of high school kids were there. And so, um, you know, I, it was like a second job for me getting people out of jail and, uh, you know, talking to stressed out parents and so on. Um, but I, I took real note of what took place on that day. But the next day, Black Lives Matter called for a protest on Capitol Hill at Congress to get Congress to act about what had just happened the day before. And I'll never forget it because I, I drove up uh, to the Capitol Plaza right in front of the building and I parked and I turned to walk up and I saw this huge phalanx of National Guardsmen and women standing with guns and bayonets there. And uh, I guess the protest hadn't really begun, but there were just a few dozen Black Lives Matter protesters out there. And I sort of took uh, mental note of this image of just a huge National Guard contingent there to protect the Capitol. And so when they asked me, will we be safe? I just replayed that image in my mind. I said, well, yeah, of course uh, you'll be safe. We'll all be safe because it might be crazy outside, but it's going to be fine on the inside, right? Famous last words. So um, I tell the story in the book of what happened um, on January 6th. Um, and how uh, there were really two streams of attack on the receipt and the counting of the Electoral College votes. Um, and there were really three rings of sedition on that day, uh, as I came to see it. And one was a mass crowd that Donald Trump had invited to Washington in order to uh, stop the steal and for a wild protest against the government. Um, and that mass crowd became uh, a mob and engaged in mob violence that inflicted terrible wounds on our officers, 150 of whom suffered broken jaws, broken necks, broken noses, broken vertebrae, broken ribs, lost fingers, heart attacks, strokes, traumatic brain injuries, and post-traumatic stress syndrome. I have officers who are my constituents who live in the 8th District who to this day are going in for physical therapy twice a week and mental therapy once a week, still trying to recover from the wounds inflicted on that day. Okay, that was the most innocent ring of the activity. There was a middle ring, which I call the ring of the insurrection. And this was the domestic violent extremist groups who had been assembled for the express and premeditated purpose of attacking the Capitol and interfering with the peaceful counting of ballots for the first time in American history, interrupting the counting of the Electoral College votes. Um, this was the Proud Boys, who Donald Trump had told to stand back and stand by at the first presidential debate. This was the Oath Keepers, um, more than a dozen of whom have been charged with seditious conspiracy, which means conspiracy to overthrow the government. Three of them have already pleaded guilty to conspiracy to overthrow the government. It includes the three percenters, the QAnon networks, the Ku Klux Klan, the Aryan nations, uh, the First Amendment, Praetorian, dozens of groups you've never uh, heard of who came uh, and succeeded in that day in helping to convert this mass crowd into a mob to attack the officers, and then proceeded to smash our windows, attack the cops who were trying to guard the building knock down the doors, invade the Capitol, and interrupt for the first time in American history the peaceful transfer of power in our country, and they succeeded in doing it. So, 
the innermost core and the other stream of activity came from what I call the realm of the coup. And coup is an odd word to use in American political parlance because we don't have a lot of experience with coups in our own country. Uh, we think of a coup as something that takes place by the military against the president. But this was a coup that was orchestrated by the president against the vice president, against the Congress, and against the people. It's what the political scientists have come to learn call a self-coup. And it's a self-coup because it is a sitting president who decides he cannot remain in power through the lawful, peaceful transfer of power and through the electoral process, through the constitutional order, and decides just to knock over the entire card table uh, and go outside the constitutional order to use violence and to use strategic uh, trickery and mischief in order to seize the presidency. And that's exactly what happened to us on that day. So I tell that story of what happened. Uh, and that was a very long day, and it was a long night. I didn't get home to 4.30 in the morning. Uh, Tabitha and Hank were hiding out in Steny Hoyer's office under Steny's desk. They had barricaded themselves in with my chief of staff. They had pushed all the furniture they could uh, up against the door. Uh, Julie Tegan, my chief of staff, wielded a fire pick from the fireplace uh, over the door as the mob uh, pounded and banged on the door and chanted, hang Mike Pence and we want Trump. And Tabitha um, hid under the desk. And you know, there's a little hole on the top of the desk where the, the wires go through. She said that she couldn't decide whether it would be better to fill in the hole and not see what was happening or keep the hole open but risk being seen. And this is what was going through her head uh, as, as they were hiding from the mob. But our officers heroically uh, resisted the mob and saved our lives. So please don't talk to me anybody on any side of the political spectrum about defund the police. The police saved our lives from fascists and racists who were marauding and attacking us. You know, Officer Hodges, who got stuck in the doorway, you know, who was screaming as they were spraying bear mace and tear gas and beating him up. When they finally dislodged him after 10 or 15 minutes of him being tortured in front of the whole world, they went back and then they poured water in his face and water in his eyes to clean out his eyes from all of these unknown chemicals that the mob was spraying in his face. And you know what he did? He went back out and he rejoined the battle and went back and fought. And we've got members of Congress who will not even vote for an investigation into this violent insurrection against the Congress. I've got, I've got a lot of police officers who are constituents who are heroes on that day. Officer Dunn, who helped to save our lives, who was treated to ruthless, merciless, violent, racist, taunting, and insults all day long. And Officer Dunn, at the end of the day, um, after helping save our lives, went back into the Capitol and he just shouted out, is this America? Is this America, man? And he said that that's what broke his heart, seeing that fellow citizens could level that kind of violence and that kind of hatred um, in an attempt to overthrow our electoral process. But any, in any event, I, we got out alive. They got us out alive uh, because of their heroism and because Mike Pence refused to go along with their plan because Donald Trump never accepted the results of the 2020 presidential election and he was preparing people. He was conditioning his followers not to accept the result of the 2020 election. He was running around the country saying, there's only one way I can lose this election and that's if it's stolen from us. And then when he lost the election by more than 7 million votes, 306 to 232 in Electoral College, on election night, Donald Trump said, we were on our way to winning. In fact, we did win this election, he said. And he's never backed down from that once and continued to try to make war on the electoral process. He went to court, which is good. That's what you're supposed to do in America. 
if you think there's fraud or corruption, then 60 courts, including 60 state and federal judges, including eight of whom he appointed to the bench, rejected every claim of electoral fraud and corruption that uh, he asserted and his uh, followers asserted. So that's when they turned to try to get the state legislatures just to appoint electors for him and to dishonor the votes of the people. And the legislatures refused to do that. And that's when he tried to shake down the election officials like Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger in Georgia. Remember, just find me 11,780 votes. That's all I want. I'm a politician. That's all I want. 11,780 votes. Just find me those. That's not Donald Trump trying to block election fraud. That's Donald Trump trying to commit election fraud and being caught red-handed in the eyes of the world. And the Forsyth County prosecutors are not done with him yet over that attempt to steal the election of Georgia. And then, and then it was on to the idea, you may remember this one, where Michael Flynn, his disgraced former national security advisor who had to resign after 18 days in office for lying about his contacts with the Russians. Um, Michael Flynn had the idea, let's go seize the election machinery all over the country with the military, and then we will rerun the election. Because all of you know that provision in the, uh, in the Constitution, which allows the military to seize the election machinery and then rerun the election, right? You guys know about that one. Well, the Department of Justice refused to go along with it, and he had a whole plan to replace the, his own hand-picked attorney general. But then they threatened to resign en masse with dozens of lawyers saying no. They couldn't get the Department of Homeland Security to do it, and they couldn't get the Department of Defense to do it. So then it was on to Vice President Mike Pence. This was the, the last uh, effort, the Hail Mary. And it was very simple plan. Let's get Vice President Mike Pence to declare unprecedented, extra constitutional, unlawful, unilateral powers simply to reject and nullify votes coming in from Arizona, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. Let's let Mike Pence just vaporize the will of tens of millions of Americans who've already cast their vote and the certificates of ascertainment that were sent in by the governors. And they bombarded him with meetings and emails and texts. They mobilized a whole campaign to get him to do it. And Mike Pence, who I, I must admit to my mind uh, for the last four years uh, had demonstrated a lot of uh, invertebrate sycophancy uh, to the president. Uh, on that day, he maintained his oath of office. He did his job and he refused to go along with it. And he is on that day a constitutional hero uh, for what he did, as was Liz Cheney, who was the chair of the House Republican Conference, who said, along with the chair of the House Democratic Caucus, Hakeem Jeffries, along with all of us, we have got to go back in. No matter how long we've got to stay here, we have got to go back in and count the Electoral College votes. And also heroes were the people in the clerk of the Senate's office and the Senate parliamentarian's office who took the mahogany boxes filled with the Electoral College votes out with them when they had to flee from the Senate as all of us were uh, running to get away from the coup plotters and insurrectionists. They took the electoral votes with them. Had they not done that, who knows uh, what would have happened? Because uh, we are still using, as you know, the electoral college system uh, that goes back to the 18th century. And I do talk about this in the book, how I think it has become a positive danger to us. Because if, if you have candidates and parties operating in good faith, well, then they will agree to be bound by the popular will uh, in the states and the electors that are sent in by the legislatures and the governors. But if you don't, there are so many nooks and crannies in this electoral college system that you can plant a lot of booby traps and now you can set up opportunities for violence. You know, the guy who sits next to me in the rules committee at Perlmutter from Colorado said, in the old days, the first Wednesday of January after the election was a day of celebration. It would take about 10 minutes. We would accept the electoral college votes. We would have the peaceful transfer of power. We would name the new president. And now you can get killed on that day because of the disrespect for democratic norms that is being shown by a political party, which I say in my book now no longer operates like a political party. 
the party of Lincoln has become an authoritarian religious political cult of Donald Trump bound to the word of one man and you cannot cross him in any way and if you do they will expel you they will ostracize you they will vilify you uh, the way they're doing to Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger and Mitt Romney and anyone in their party who just stands up for the Constitution and the rule of law. So that's the second part of the book and the third and final part is about the trial and the impeachment trial and I'll let you guys get to that. All I will say is there have been four presidential impeachment trials in American history and one was Andrew Johnson for his real crimes in trying to unravel the reconstruction uh, but it was not a, a perfectly argued case and that one failed. Uh, the next was Bill Clinton who was impeached for doing you know what uh, and uh, that was an absurd and ludicrous uh, abuse of the impeachment power because it did not involve public offenses against the union and against the constitution and the rule of law. The third was the impeachment um, and trial of Donald Trump for the Ukraine shakedown. And uh, I have something to say about uh, what we did in that one uh, in my book. But the fourth and the final one was the impeachment of Donald Trump for inciting a violent insurrection to overthrow the union. The vote in the Senate was the most sweeping bipartisan vote in American history to convict a president for crimes against the union, for high crimes and misdemeanors. We won the votes of 50 Democrats, all 50 Democrats. We won the votes of seven Republicans uh, who were there from all over the country, New England, the Mid-Atlantic, the South, uh, the Midwest, the West, Alaska, but alas, that was not enough. And I, uh, I fault those senators for not living up to two oaths of office. And one oath is to uphold and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And the other oath was the oath they swore as jurors to render impartial justice, which means nonpartisan justice, not following your party, not following the dictates of political ambition, but following the evidence and the rule of law. And so when Mitch McConnell went out there after the trial, you may remember the speech he gave, and he said that Donald Trump was morally and ethically and practically responsible for everything that happened, and he should be punished in the future through the rule of law and prosecution and so on. But, he said, um, there was no jurisdiction to hear the case. A legal point that we had dismissed on the very first day of the trial by a vote of 54 to 46, when they claimed the way that defendants have been claiming for more than two centuries that the Senate cannot try an impeachment if the defendant has since left public office. It's been rejected every single time. Uh, it was rejected in detail by the Senate, most famously in the Belknap decision after the Civil War. It was rejected in the very first Congress when someone was impeached. And there are simply no arguments there in the text of the Constitution in the precedent, in the structure. And if you think about it, it's just a ludicrous argument because if somebody could avoid impeachment and trial and conviction by not being in office, they could just resign and then go out and start all over again. But there's a provision where after someone is convicted, then they must stand trial for disqualification. We can vote to disqualify them further. Why? Because in America, what's important is not the ambitions of one man or woman, no matter how great they are or how evil they are, what matters is the democracy itself and that we have government that serves the people. All of us who aspire and attain the public office in American democracy are nothing but the servants of the people. We are there to serve the people. In the day that we think we are lords and kings and princes and queens and everybody else is a subject, that is the day to evict, eject, reject, impeach, convict, and start all over again. Okay? That's what democracy is. So, my, my book began as a love letter to our lost son, uh, Tommy, um, and it ended as a love letter. Um, to my country. Um, so
So the floor is open for questions. Um, I marched with all the women um, recently about abortion. What are you doing to reclaim abortion for American women? Thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, so the House of Representatives has voted to codify Roe versus Wade in Planned Parenthood versus Casey. We already voted to do that, and if we could get it through the Senate, we would have a national law, a federal law, inscribing the right of women to make a personal judgment and decision about their exercise of what is today a constitutional right. Um, the Senate, of course, um, has become the absolute blockade to progress to everything that we want. Um, they've blockaded the For the People Act to guarantee the right to vote. They've blockaded the John Lewis Voting Rights Act um, to guarantee and secure the right to vote. And we sent that over uh, just recently. And of course, the filibuster is there to destroy our chances of getting that through the Senate. We had a hearing in our House Judiciary Committee this week. I don't know if you saw that hearing, but just as we are trying to pass a federal law to guarantee women's right to choose in every state in the union, they are trying to pass a federal law, and this was the official Republican witness testifying before Republicans, all of whom agreed with her. She testified that their goal is a federal law banning abortion in every state of the union, in the District of Columbia, in every territory, in every case, with no exception for rape or incest. And we don't know even where they are on the life of the mother, because I'm reading a lot of the anti-abortion people uh, saying that they think that women lie about that, and it gives uh, doctors the chance to lie. So, my friends, everything is on the ballot in 2022 and 2024. Everything is up for grabs in our country right now. The democracy itself is under siege. Here in America, the way it's under siege, all over the world, the way that democracy is under siege in Russia, where uh, Putin is throwing his political opponents into jail. He's throwing the leaders of the anti-war movement into jail. It is a crime now in Russia even to describe the military intervention in Ukraine as a war. You can't say that. They are banning books there. In Belarus, check out the irony of this one. They banned 1984 by George Orwell yesterday. Okay. The authoritarians and the totalitarians, uh, the kings, all of the dictators are working to thwart democracy and freedom. And it's come to our shores. And we saw it on January the 6th. And we're seeing it in the Supreme Court now. Because we've had for 50 years in our Constitution a constitutional right to privacy. They're not just about to destroy the constitutional right to choose an abortion. They're about to destroy a constitutional right to privacy, which includes the right to contraception. They want to get rid of IUDs. They want to get rid of morning after pills. They want to make it a crime to use um, abortifacients that are uh, prescribed by a doctor as medication. The right to privacy protects the right of our people against compulsory abortion and compulsory sterilization. You know, tens of thousands of women in the last century were sterilized against their will on the grounds that they were unfit to be parents. Thousands of them in Virginia. And the Supreme Court struck it down on the grounds that even though sterilization is not mentioned in the Constitution, still there's a constitutional right to privacy that protects privacy in procreative and reproductive decision-making of the citizenry. And you know what else it protects? Another word that's not in the Constitution, like abortion's not in the Constitution. Marriage. Loving versus Virginia. Remember that one? That people have a right to marry someone of a different race or ethnicity, even if the state has decided in its wisdom that they shouldn't do that and that's a crime, that was struck down based on the right to marry under the right to privacy, just like the right of our gay and lesbian brothers and sisters to marry was established in the Obergefell decision. Although I must say, we did it here in Maryland one year before the decision in the Supreme Court. Um, so my friends, you see everything's under attack, Lincoln, what once said, he was asked to compare the Constitution and the Declaration. He said, well, the Constitution, it's like the silver platter guarding the golden apple of liberty and freedom for all, which is in the middle. And the platter exists to protect the apple. The apple doesn't exist to protect 
the platter. But today, the platter, the silver platter of democracy, is under vicious, dangerous attack. The right to vote is a, under attack across the country by these voter suppression statutes, by the gerrymandering of our congressional and state legislative districts. The right to vote, the right to a fair election is under attack by uh, attempts to subvert elections and say, well, even after the voters have cast their votes, there will be a partisan body appointed by the governor or a state legislature to review the results. And this is taking place across the country. So democracy is under attack and freedom is under attack too. And that's a freedom, the constitutional right to privacy, that is supported by the vast majority of the American people. Democracy and freedom are on the same side, but what we're getting is a tiny political minority which is trying to destroy the rights of the majority and the rights of the people in our country. So don't lie down and let them do that to us. Let's get up and let's fight back together. Everybody needs to read this if you have not already. My question is, how how did you find the strength to write this book? You went through so much in such a small time that none of us can ever imagine. And where did you find the strength to put it into words for us? Well, thank you for your your kind thoughts. Um, you know, and so many people ask me this question that I I'm not even sure I know how to answer it uh, because you know I've written you know three or four other books before. Um, Including, by the way, a book that just got banned in Texas. Uh, I, I found out yesterday my book, We the Students, which is about all the Supreme Court cases that affect young people in public high school, like locker searches and drug testing and censorship of the newspaper and your book. That's been banned. And, and somebody asked me for a comment on it after our hearing, one of the reporters, and I said, well, please advise them that they should at least read Board of Education versus PICO, which I think is in chapter two before they ban it, because it's all about how you cannot remove books from the school library just because somebody uh, finds that it offends them. You know, I, I always like that line from Lenny Bruce. Um, he, you know, he was up doing his comedy on stage and someone yelled out, that's offensive. And he said, my parents came to America in order to be offensive and not get thrown into jail for it, okay? Because uh, every book offends somebody. But in any event, um, you know, th those other books um, were very different. They, I didn't write them in as personal a way. And um, this was a book that chose me. I mean, I couldn't sleep uh, and I, you know, it, it would get so late I couldn't even call friends on the West Coast, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I realized that um, I would either spend the rest of my life obsessed with this 50-day period between um, us losing Tommy on New Year's Eve of December uh, of 2020 and then Valentine's Day, which is when the trial was over, um, 2021. Either I'd spend the rest of my life being obsessed with it or I could try to at least record for my family, for my friends, for my constituents, for my country, what happened and at least tell one person's story of this uh, terrible time. And it was very therapeutic and cathartic for me to write it. Um, you know, the, um, the psychologists tell us that trauma is a violent demolition of your expectations about what life will be like. Um, and, um, you know, we, Sarah and I always believed that we would have our children forever. Um, until we left the earth anyway. Uh, and um, and I always believed that America was an exceptional country and that it wasn't vulnerable to, crew, to coups and insurrections and so on. And I've come to believe um, that what makes us exceptional is not that we're immune to racism and white nationalism and fascism, um, but that we have the will as a people to keep learning and to keep fighting and to keep struggling to be a more perfect union. That's what makes us exceptional as a country. So there are two words I talk about in the book that I didn't use before, basically out of superstition. And one of them was suicide. I didn't talk about it. 
with Tommy, and I fault myself intently for that, um, because I think I thought if we didn't talk about it, or if we did talk about it, it would make it somehow more likely, like it would conjure it up, and if we didn't talk about it, it could somehow make it go away. But, you know, not talking about suicide to someone battling depression is like not talking to a teenager about sex. You know, you might think you're being slick and making it go away, but you're not. And so I vow to use that word, and I hope that all of you will use that word. Uh, as Tommy used to say, there's no such thing as a bad word. And there is no such thing as a bad word. It's a very bad idea. Um, it's a terrible, it's just a terrible, terrible thing to try to manage. But it's not a bad word, and the word must be used if we're going to be able to counter it and oppose it. And the other word is the word fascism. I, I, you know, if you check out Madeleine Albright's book called Fascism, A Warning, um, she talks about the importance of using that word. And she also says that, you know, fascism does not have a fixed and finite ideological content. It's mutating. But she says what fascism really is, is a strategy for taking power for a small group, a family, a handful of corporations or businesses against everybody else and then keeping that power. That's the opposite of America. But if we're going to defeat fascism, we got to talk about it. So I'm going to use that word. Congressman, without disclosing any confidential information, can you tell us whether you think any charges will eventually be brought against any of your colleagues in the House or the Senate uh, arising out of their aiding and abetting the rioters there at the Capitol on January 6th. Well, thank you, but luckily I don't have any confidential information to, uh, to leak to anybody because I have no idea. You know, the January 6th Select Committee, as you, uh, as you understand, of course, is an investigatory body charged under House Resolution 503 with going out and getting the facts about what happened on January 6th and then looking at the causes of the coup and the insurrection and then making recommendations about how to fortify our institutions and our values going forward. That's all we're doing. Um, we're making everything public. We're reporting everything to the Congress and to the people because this is a democracy and it's the people's government and the people have a right to decide. And that includes, of course, the Department of Justice. They will get whatever information we've got. It'll be available to prosecutors, lawyers, and public defenders across the nation. But it is up to the United States Department of Justice about whether or not to bring charges. And I know people are um, impatient. I know people feel like Donald Trump has been getting away with crimes against the union for decades now. Uh, I can relate to that. Um, and I know that it's very frustrating uh, to people um, how it seems like a certain class of people always uh, acts with impunity and immunity. And we must reject that because under democracy and the rule of law, nobody is above the law. We have no kings or queens here. We were conceived in radical insurgency against kings and queens and the rights of kings and queens. All of us are subject uh, to the law. We have no titles of nobility here. Check it out, it's in the Constitution. We don't have titles of nobility and Congress can't award them. So um, look, the, the Attorney General Merrick Garland is my constituent and I don't make fun of my constituents in public and I don't uh, pressure them in public. I'll just say this, as an outside observer of what's going on over there, they brought more than 800 prosecutions already in the most sweeping and comprehensive criminal investigation and prosecution in the history of the United States. And well, it is. It seems to me, as an outside observer, they are working their way up the way that prosecutors do in normal mob prosecutions. You start with the foot soldiers, the people who attacked our officers, who assaulted federal police, who committed trespass, who destroyed federal property, who interrupted a federal proceeding, who worked to accomplish a seditious conspiracy to overthrow the government, and then you get your way all the way up to the top. So I would just say all of us 
have to stay tuned. But I will make one, uh, you know, final coda observation, which is, um, you know, injustice, I've come to realize people feel much more intensely than justice. You know, and I've seen this in these, all of these terrible uh, hate crime assaults, like the one in Buffalo last weekend. Um, 10 of our people murdered in the supermarket by an 18 year old kid jacked up on white supremacy that you can see every night on Fox News and other channels around the country, jacked up on white replacement theory, this poisonous doctrine which my colleagues refuse to renounce and refuse to denounce. And they can denounce critical race theory and they can they can lambast critical race theory, but they can't say anything about white replacement theory, the poisonous idea that the white population is being systematically replaced by liberals or Jews bringing in black and brown people. What kind of sickness is that, that that's being taught to kids? He was 18 years old, 18 years old, barely an adult, and, have, and having imbibed that much hatred that much racism, that much derangement, that he would go out and massacre innocent people. So, I forgot why I got into that. <laughs> I, I can't remember, how did I get into that? But anyway, you know, the, these, you know, these massacres are taking place. Oh, I was talking about justice and injustice. You know, when people feel the injustice, the indignity, the savagery of what happened, well, Amazingly, he was taken alive, unlike George Floyd, for example. Uh, he had an AR-15 on him and he was taken alive, which is, that's a separate story. But uh, in any event, he was taken alive and he'll do life in prison. We hope that he will do life in prison. Let's hope that he will. But you know what? The, the justice of that feels so paltry and so minuscule compared to the savagery of the crime. And you know what, Donald Trump could go to jail for the rest of his life for plotting the insurrection and for seditious conspiracy and for all of his crimes, the bank fraud and the financial fraud and the real estate fraud and the tax fraud and paying off the mistresses and so on. And you know what, the only thing that really matters to me is that we save American democracy for our children and our grandchildren for the future. That's what matters. That's what matters. Okay, yes. Okay, good, good. Yes. Hi. Um, two things. One is, uh, when does the public get to see, or do you have an estimated, do you have an estimated time when the public will see uh, the televised findings of the well, yes. January? Well, yes. Thank you for raising it. Okay, in, have, June, okay. in June, you will, you will be able to watch six televised hearings. Um, uh, about all of the events of January 6th, their causes, and then the beginning of what we need to do uh, in order to respond. And um, I, I believe that um, if we still have a conscience as a country, and I know that we do, and if people are still constitutionally literate and committed to the preservation of the Union, um, it will be something riveting, it will be something horrifying, and it ultimately will be something inspiring for us. Uh, because there were so many heroes involved, from Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger, a lifelong Republican who refused to fabricate ballots and refused to lie about the election, and other election officials, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, who refused to buckle under to you know authoritarian pronouncements, to the officers who saved us, to what Vice President Pence did, to everybody who's been standing up for the Constitution, the rule of law, and democracy, and you know that's where we are today. Uh, and I don't know, did I have time for one more question? Are those guys in line? Uh, yeah. Say yeah. one more thing. Um, I was a French major. Yes. Which isn't always very practical. But I do know that the word courage comes from cœur, the heart. And there's a saying, out of great love comes courage. So I just deeply want to thank you for your love of this country.
Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, so my question to you is, uh, based on the Supreme Court's recent decision of removing the uh, donation cap to winning candidates of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and saying that money is protected under the First Amendment, um, how would the general public still have faith in our institutions when it feels like those who have a great amount of wealth are pulling the strings uh, despite the populace's... Well, look, I, I, I'm so glad that you raised that point. Um, and uh, we've been struggling under the weight of huge, organized, big money since the Citizens United decision. Uh, and we've been dealing with uh, the flood of money in politics really since Buckley versus Vallejo, which goes back to 1976. Um, but you're right, there's yet another decision uh, by the Supreme Court which seems hell-bent on demolishing all campaign finance law. And, um, you know, it's going to be a long walk home for us to solve this money problem, and I write a lot about it in uh, Unthinkable, because I fault my party, I fault us for um, not having designed that first impeachment around President Trump's conversion of the presidency into a money-making operation for himself, his family, and his businesses. They were in naked violation of the Foreign Government Emoluments Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause, which says that the president is limited to a salary in office and he may not take any other money from the federal government. And they were getting millions and millions of dollars going to the golf courses and the hotels from the FBI and from the Secret Service and from the Department of Defense and the Department of Commerce. They were getting millions and millions of dollars from foreign governments. And it continues. I mean, just last week, Jared Kushner walked off with a cool $2 billion from Saudi Arabia. That's, you know, that's a pretty nice summer internship for Mr. Uh, Kushner uh, to pull down uh, after his service in the Trump administration. But we failed to explain to the country what was going on there. Uh, Trump just uh, made $100 million off of selling the lease to the Trump Hotel in D.C., the old post office building, um, when the law says that um, no public official can derive any benefit or any revenue from it, and he's making money on it during all of those years in naked violation of domestic emoluments clause, in violation of the terms of the GSA lease, and now he just made another $100 million off of it. And I, and I had legislation to change the name of the Trump Hotel to the Washington Emoluments. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought, uh, I thought it should be a stop on the tour buses so people could see what's become of our government. So look, America's a great country. There are a lot of ways people can make money. People can get rich here. That's great. Going into public service should not be a way that people get rich in America. Okay? It should be public service. So thank you very much. And we're good to go. All right. I'm going to, I think, I think we got to go. Uh, I, I think we got to go. I would love to stay. I'm going to sign some books. Um, but I, I will leave you with the words of Tom Paine, who our Tommy was named after. And, um, you know, he wrote uh, Common Sense, uh, the great revolutionary pamphlet that inspired the Declaration of Independence and inspired the revolutionaries. And in 1776, he also wrote another pamphlet called The Crisis to give people courage, bon courage, as our friend said, to give people courage. Um, so I just wanted to quote a passage uh, of it uh, for you. And I, I did quote it at the impeachment trial uh, as well. but. Uh, Speaker Pelosi makes me um, update the language just so it doesn't offend modern sensibilities. And she points out rightfully that Tom Paine was an early feminist who was fighting for the right of women to vote and an early abolitionist too. But anyway, he wrote this pamphlet and he said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. These are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country. But everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man and every woman for all time. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. 
the more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. Let's make that victory ours.